tell me a bit about the history of those dub plate specials for Jamaican sound systems in general. Because you said singers were already doing dub plate You're specials right. even before, right? Yeah. So there has been always some some sort of artist doing exclusive s- things for a certain yeah. sound system. How how was that like? Well, okay. Um, dub, you, you basically have two types of dub plate. Um, you have the dub plate where a producer would make a new song mm-hmm. and then you would go to the studio with the, um, the producer. He might have that song on a 24 track mm-hmm. and they make an exclusive mix for you um, so you can play it. Mm-hmm. No, that mix that he made for you is not recorded and saved um, by the producer. So if he's gonna do another mix, it, it, it no matter how much they try, they can't get it perfectly alike like the one you have. Mm-hmm. So yours becomes something special. Mm-hmm. So we, back in the days, we used to play to play it special that it didn't have any anybody singing or glorifying or bigging up your sound mm-hmm. system, but okay. it would be exclusive because nobody else wouldn't have that particular mix. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have the other one now where you would carry the singer to the studio and make the singer sing something special for the sound. And in those days, they wouldn't really be calling out um, selectors name or the, even the, the sound system names too much, mm-hmm. just a little. Mm-hmm. And then um, it was mostly like singers because back in the days, people wasn't really cutting DJs and dub plate. But um, there was something else that was happening at the time. Most of the, the foreign sound systems, when they have a big dance in, like, say, in the UK, they would um, come down and book a Jamaican DJ and take the Jamaican DJs overseas mm-hmm. to work as a guest on the dance. And after a while, they find that was very expensive. So they would come to Jamaica and voice the artists and dub plate, uh-huh. take them back and play them. So when some of the Jamaican sound systems started to uh, travel and they go over there and see that happening and they liked it, they figured that, you know, that is something they could do. Because those are sound systems that we used to describe in those days as juggling sound systems. Uh-huh. Those sound system didn't have a full-time singer or a DJ working with them. Okay. I'm not going to call names, but you can figure them out. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of them still are around. Mm-hmm. Okay. And because plenty of these sound system, they didn't want to be bothered with employing a full-time DJ or a full-time singer because it costs money. Mm-hmm. Of course, yes. And they didn't bother that much with dub plate either because they usually play mostly vinyl. Mm -hmm. But whenever you have a clash and you want to play something really special or exclusive, then it has to be a dub plate. It can be the same record that everybody buy at the record shop. Yes, of course. So they realize how important dub plates were. Mm -hmm. So little by little, everybody started to, you know, have dub plates. But then, of course, you have some corrupted people who um, refuse to pay the artists what the artists want, and they might find some little imitator who pretend right. to be DJing like a certain DJ. And sometimes, with technology, they learn how to splice songs, mm-hmm. and they cut right. out other sound name and put their sound name. So, Technology helped the scammers them a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> which is right, which is right. Yeah. So we stick to the real sound system, like Kilimanjaro, well, because also little by little your sound has developed into a clash sound, even though I think that was not your no, original intention, right? No. I never had any intention or plan to brand Kilimanjaro as a clash sound. Um, Clashing, you know, it came about because um, 
Some people might think it's a show off, but I'll tell you the truth, Kilimanjaro was doing very well and we had very good support. And some younger sound system got jealous, wanted our position and figured that, why if we kick with Kilimanjaro foot or beat them in a clash, then we will get all the fame they have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they come with the challenges and we had to defend it. It's like self-defense. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And we, we, we did it in a serious way. And we defended the sound system. Mm -hmm. And I can say we, we, def we defeated a whole lot of them. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, people started to brand us Clash Sound. But that wasn't the intention. The intention was just to entertain people and make people have fun. Mm -hmm. So if it was for you, you would have just played dance and played music? Well, um, I, I still support playing every kind of music because every kind of people come to dance and you need to entertain people. Mm -hmm. And I like dance and music. I like the original reggae music. I like everything about Jamaican music. I mean... Some, not so much, but I still have love for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have several people that played on Jaro Sound that have been, um, that have played very, very important clashes. Jeremy Lee did that uh, with Silverhawk. We ha you had Trooper clashing against Addis. You had Freddy Krueger yeah. against Mighty Crown. A whole lot of very yeah. important clashes. The greatest clash of all times is Jaro versus Addis. What do you think is important when clashing for the sound system and also for the people operating the sound system? Well, um, we, we were involved in clashes even before um, Germany time. And as you know, Germany is before Trooper because Ainsley was there. And Ainsley um, pulled off quite a bit of clashes in Kingston, especially in Skateland. Mm -hmm. That's where we started to make a serious name. Mm -hmm. um, But one of the most important things, I believe, is that a selector have to study the venue and the crowd, the people in the dance, and play for the people. You can't go inside there and just play for yourself because you're not going to get their support. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you can play to keep the people in the dance happy, play for them then you stand a much better chance of coming out on top. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about those days in Skateland. When was that and how was the vibe like down there? Well, Skateland, um, um, some of the best days in Skateland was like in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And Skateland was a place where um, it's a central location, halfway tree in Kingston. And this is where you find a lot of young people can uh, congregate because we used to have a skating ring mm -hmm. and music is playing there all the while. Mm -hmm. And the promoter, who act, the person who, who operated the place, um, he was a person who loved music mm -hmm. and he kept a whole lot of events. And when we started to work for him, his name is Jingles, God rest his soul. Um, He, he fell in love with the sound system. Mm -hmm. And we had a good thing going. We, we really played a whole lot of so, so regular juggling dance and clashes. And I believe that um, some people even got jealous at one stage because they wanted to know why we play in there so regular. Skateland was like our yard. Mm -hmm. And And um, people would just come to Skateland to hear Kilimanjaro even before they know if a dance is promoted because they expect to find us there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd say it's one of the greatest venues that in Kingston mm -hmm. for, for dances, clashes, anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And from 
you starting to cut door plates in the beginning you cut those door plates at other people's studio right yeah channel one i think yeah jammies um, one of the fr earlier places i started to cut door plate was toby's and channel one joe gibbs and later on um jammies mm -hmm. and then um I decided that I'd like to cut my window plate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I bought my machine and set it up at my house. And that's where I used to cut my door plate. And by the time Ricky Trooper joined the sound system, um, he, he, he was the one who kind of encouraged me to, you know, build a little studio outside uh, other than my home. Because um, at that time, well, I, when I set up the, the studio first, I didn't have any kids. Mm -hmm. But by that time, I started having kids. And, you know, this is my house. Yes, right. And the environment wouldn't be good for artists coming there. And some of these people like, like to smoke. And I don't want that around the kids. Mm -hmm. So we decided to get a place. So we did. Um, get a, a nice place and ready to show it, and that's where we used to operate for a while. Mm -hmm. And then we eventually moved from there to the, this location where I am now. Mm -hmm. But um, it, was, it, it was much better for me to have my own studio because we didn't have any time limit. We could work through the night if we had to. Mm -hmm. and. You know, when it's yours, you can do whatever you want, when you want. Mm -hmm. And some people, some artists actually spend the entire day there, right? Yeah. Who would be there on a regular? There was a time, you know, when um, the, 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 the studio was extremely busy and it used to attract a whole lot of artists. Um, I wouldn't want to start naming any names because some people if I miss the name, they might believe it's a disrespect. Yes, yes. But most of the major artists used to be here in those days. But um, we had to scale down um, because the place was attracting a lot of crowd and we even get some visits from the police yes. and, you know, some warnings too. Mm -hmm. So we, we had to work within a, a certain framework. Okay, I see. So we, we, we scaled on things a mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but I think someone that was very close to Jaro, popularly known also the relationship, and someone you would also call a friend was Garnet Silk, right? Yeah, well, Garnet Silk was one of the, the early artists that used to spend a whole lot of time here. So can you say approximately how much Garnet Silk Jaro could play? Your oh boy, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I I can recall several, but I can't count them. So I have to promise to give you that number at a later date. Ah, <laughs> but I remember that at some point you told me that you even had stuff on, on tape still that was never even mixed as yet. Have yeah, you mixed the, them um, as yet? Well, right now we have some tapes, some two-track tapes that I'm planning to go through because um, some of these tapes were actually stored away. Mm -hmm. And since we're um, planning to leave this location, um, start clearing out some stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm coming across some stuff mm -hmm. that I haven't seen for years. Yeah. Hopefully they're still good. But that means technically that you could play a clash like next year and play some garnet silk that people have never heard before, right? Well, we may be able to play some, not just garnet silk, but some oh, other artists too that some people have never heard before. Mm 